I used to think backwoods Tennessee was just like anywhere else in America. A bit backwards, maybe, but mostly familiar. Worked with my hands, fixing cars, a little construction, same as any guy, you know? That was before I met up with Cletus and started running moonshine into those fog-drenched hollers. Cletus was born and bred in those hills, knew every bootlegger's trail like the back of his hand. City boy me? I was just along for the adventure. Thought I was pretty hot stuff in my souped-up 72 Torino. One clear night miles from any paved road is where it went bad. I'm telling you, that old forest felt different. Trees seemed to lean in, shadows deeper than any night sky should make. I joked to Cletus, kinda nervous like, You sure there ain't werewolves out here? That's when I heard it, a howl, but not like no dog I ever heard. Deep, raspy, and damn close. Cletus went stone still, muttered something about how we shouldn't be out here this late. Now, I ain't one to spook easy, but there was something in the air, a wrongness I could taste. That's when I saw it. Uphill, half hidden between the trees, a pair of eyes reflecting our headlights. Not yellow, not red, but a kind of sickly, moonlight green. The rest was a hulking shape, like a man, but way too big, all coarse gray fur and long limbs. Floor it! Cletus screamed. And let me tell you, I didn't need telling twice. Tires spitting gravel, I slammed that gas pedal. I aimed that Torino down the track, hoping we could outrun whatever was back there. We couldn't. That thing, whatever it was, moved too fast. Cletus swore, reached under his seat. He came up with an old shotgun, loaded it with a practiced hand. Aim for the head, he shouted over the engine's roar. Aim for its goddamn head! I looked back as we hit a bump. The damned thing was gaining on us. I could see its long muzzle, those sharp teeth glinting in the dim light. Closer and closer it came, claws digging into our back bumper. Now! Cletus yelled. I spun that wheel hard left, slamming the brakes. We careened down a side trail while that beast, whatever it was, kept on the main path. We were out of sight, but it wouldn't take long to track us. Cletus threw open his door, hauled me out behind him. Run, you fool! Find somewhere to hide! I did. Ran like hell itself was at my heels. I could hear his shotgun going off behind me, and the howls got louder, angrier. Then I tripped. Something tore into my calf. I screamed, rolled to my side. The thing was there, towering over me, those green eyes burning, breath hot with the stench of meat. Its claw raised to strike. Cletus tackled it from the side, yelling something about covering my head. Gunshots rang out. The thing roared, and Cletus screamed. I looked to see Cletus on his back, the thing's jaws locked around his neck. He was still firing, blood splashing the forest floor. I managed to crawl back, scrambling amongst the tree roots. The sound of snapping bones made me throw up in the dirt, and through the gaps in the leaves, I saw... It was dragging Cletus off into the trees, his legs trailing uselessly behind. I heard his screams fading, choked off by a terrible sound. I lay there, shaking, listening to the crunching of branches. It knew where I was. It was just toying with me. That's when I decided survival was my only option. Pain lanced through my wounded leg, but I dragged myself upright, stumbled toward the trail. I don't know how far I ran, but I found the road eventually, stumbled out into the open, flagged down a passing pickup, told them a wild animal attacked us that, well, that my friend, they never found a body. No trace of Cletus or that thing out there. I still drive those roads sometimes, making deliveries. It ain't the same. The woods feel off, like they're always watching. I'll swear to you on my mama's grave, there's something else living out there. Something that sees us as nothing more than prey. I spent some time last fall cleaning out my grandparents' old cabin up in the Ozarks. It's a little place way out in the sticks, with no one around for miles. My buddy Rhett loves that kind of thing, so he decided to tag along and help me out with the hauling. His folks have some property in the area too, and we used to hang out there all the time when we were kids. 
we arrived at the cabin on a crisp Wednesday afternoon. Grandma and Grandpa passed a few years back, leaving the place pretty much deserted. We figured it'd take a few days to clean things out. A lot of old dust and musty boxes. Our plan was to haul away any junk, donate anything usable, and maybe sell a couple of antiques that might be worth something. That night, after a day of hauling boxes, we went into town for some grub. Typical greasy diner food, but we were tired and starving. When we got back, that's when things started getting weird. Dude, did you hear that? Red asked, pausing in the middle of unpacking his bag. Hear what? That howling. Sounded like a wolf, but way too close. He squinted in the direction of the trees, the porch light casting long shadows across the yard. I chuckled. There's coyotes around here, man. They sound freaky. Nothing to worry about. But this was different. Louder. More guttural. We both turned toward the tree line and saw the source. Eyes. Two reflective spots, just beyond the porch's light. That's not a coyote, I said under my breath. Too big, too... unnatural. Silence fell. It stood there for a few minutes, just... watching. Finally, with a low, guttural growl, it slunk back into the blackness. We locked the doors and checked the windows, the hair on our necks standing straight up. The next morning, we both tried to shake it off. Maybe the moonlight played tricks on our eyes, or we'd spooked ourselves. We got to work, trying to ignore the unease creeping around the edges of our brains. That day was mostly uneventful. It wasn't until after the sun went down, as we were cooking steaks over the fire pit, that things went sideways again. We were talking about some dumb movie we watched as kids when a deep growl sent chills down my spine. There, just barely a flicker in the moonlight, was that same pair of eyes. Okay, what the hell is going on? Rhett looked as wide-eyed as I felt. Wolves don't stalk people, dude. His words barely registered as the creature emerged fully into view. It was like a wolf, yeah, but something was all off. Too tall, hunched over with massive shoulders. Dirty, matted fur clung to its powerful limbs, ending in vicious-looking claws. The eyes, though, that's what stuck with me the most. Almost a burning orange, reflecting the firelight with impossible intensity. It let out another growl and we scrambled back inside, slamming the door. We both tried to convince ourselves it was a bear, a very strange-looking bear. The thing outside was smart, however. It tested the windows, circling the cabin, growling and occasionally scratching at the siding. What do we do? Red asked, his voice barely a whisper. Got a gun in the truck? Yeah, but is that going to work on... whatever that thing is? I shrugged helplessly. We couldn't stay inside forever, especially if it decided to force its way in. We needed an escape plan. After what felt like hours, the thing seemed to grow bored, its growls gradually fading as it disappeared into the night. We didn't get a wink of sleep that night. Exhaustion and adrenaline had us hearing phantom rustling and branches snapping outside till dawn broke. Let's get out of here, man. Red urged as the sun painted the sky with pale light. It's gone, come on. We agreed to stick together. Our guns were loaded, and we didn't go anywhere without watching each other's backs. As Rhett was getting some stuff from the truck, I heard a rustle from the tree line, and then he yelled. Not his normal voice. I whipped around, raising my gun as Rhett screamed again. But what I saw made my blood freeze. The creature had him. It pounced from the trees with uncanny speed, knocking him to the ground with a sickening thud. Its claws tore into Rhett's legs, and the man howled in pure agony. Rhett! I yelled, but the thing was too quick. It sunk its teeth into his shoulder, tearing at him like a wild animal. I fired, once, twice, until the creature finally seemed to notice me. It slowly turned and looked its eyes burning with a terrible, feral intelligence that chilled me to the core. Rhett lay on the ground, moaning, his clothes stained with blood. I couldn't leave him, not like that. I kept firing, moving backwards, praying the bullets would connect. It didn't seem phased. It began edging my way, Rhett forgotten on the ground. 
Fear pounded in my chest, and I knew I had a choice to make. Keep firing hopelessly, or run for the truck. I glanced at Rhett, his ragged breaths growing fainter by the second. He mouthed something to me, something I couldn't make out. I aimed one last desperate shot at the creature, turned and sprinted towards the truck. I, I don't remember much about the drive to the nearest town. My mind was a blur of panic and terror. I knew I'd done everything I could, but the guilt of leaving Rhett, it ate at me like acid. But there was no way I could go back. Not alone, not with whatever that thing was out there. Somehow, I convinced a skeptical deputy that my friend had run off into the woods, maybe injured or delirious. The search was fruitless. We scoured the area for days, but there was no sign of him other than a trail of blood leading from the cabin to the spot of the struggle. The incident became a local mystery. Rumors flew around town. An escaped convict, a bear attack, a drug deal gone bad. The thing out there, whatever it was, disappeared back into the anonymity of the Ozarks. I spent weeks after in a daze. I stayed mostly at my parents' place, barely eating or sleeping, haunted by that image of the thing's burning eyes. Every rustle of leaves, every shadow, it sent me into a panicked spiral. They told me to get therapy, talk about it, move on, like that could ever fix things. I don't tell anyone the truth about that thing, about leaving Rhett behind. I know what I saw, and the looks I get when I try to explain, it makes me question myself. Am I going crazy? But I know what's real. The memories are too sharp to be dreams. And there's this dread constantly simmering beneath the surface. A part of me thinks that creature ain't done yet. Months went by, the pain never fully dulling, but the nightmares started to subside. I forced myself to get back to work, to try and stick to a routine. My dad kept an eye on me, worried I was going off the deep end. Then came the news report. Two hikers discovered skeletal remains in a remote section just across the state line. DNA confirmed it to be Rhett. The official cause of death was an animal attack. No one bought it. It was too clean. It was as if he'd been surgically dissected. That night, I dreamt of the creature. But this time, something shifted. Its muzzle grew longer. Its form stretched out on all fours. The eyes were the same, burning with that same feral hunger. In the dream, it wasn't just hunting now. It was stalking. And I was the prey. When I woke up, I knew what I had to do. There was unfinished business. The hunting supply store in town became my second home. I researched everything about the Ozarks, wildlife, bears, coyotes, the standard things, but also local lore whispered stories about creatures that didn't fit neatly into any categories. I practiced shooting until my hands blistered, learned about tracking and survival. My dad thought I was having a breakdown. Maybe I was. But letting go, forgetting, that wasn't an option. That thing took my best friend, shattered my life. It owed me something. Weeks of preparation later, I found myself back on that dusty back road heading for my grandparents' cabin. This time, I was ready. Or at least, as ready as I could be for facing the unknown. The cabin looked the same as I remembered it. I couldn't bring myself to go inside, though. I set up camp in a clearing, the trees looming over me like silent spectators. Sleep only came in short, agitated bursts, every branch snapping making me sit bolt upright, gun in hand. I was constantly on edge, on the third night I saw it again. Just a flash of movement and those damn eyes at the edge of the firelight. It was taunting me now, testing me. I knew I could never rest until I settled this score. The chase lasted for days. I barely slept and ate even less. I tracked that creature through the Ozarks, driven by equal parts blind rage and an almost suicidal determination. At times the trail ran so cold I nearly gave up. Yet... Those eyes always seemed to find me, always leading me deeper into the woods. Then came the final confrontation, a clearing with a single gnarled oak tree in the center. The thing lunged from the shadows with impossible speed, but this time I was ready. The gunshots echoed through the forest. It screeched, not like any animal I'd ever heard. 
I kept firing, each shot a hit, sending it stumbling backwards. The beast finally collapsed, its breath ragged, those eyes burning fiercely, even in the fading light. The creature was huge, far bigger than any wolf. Its proportions were all wrong, long and lean with a disturbingly human-like face. Dirty white fur covered powerful corded muscles. It stared hatefully up at me, and for a second, I hesitated. But then Rhett's face flashed in my mind. I finished it off. It deserved no less. In the aftermath, I stumbled back to the cabin, called the police, and made up some story about finding the creature dead already. The whole self-defense routine. It stuck, sort of. But everyone looked at me differently after that. Like they didn't quite believe it, or maybe didn't want to. I don't care what they think. They call it the Ozark Stalker now. A cryptid whispered about in hushed tones around campfires. I know the truth, and it's both a burden and a relief. Some nights I dream of Rhett, and he smiles at me. Not sad, not angry. It's almost like he gets it. And maybe that's enough. I spent some of last weekend hiking on the Blue Ridge Parkway. My buddy Xanthus and I are always looking for a little weekend adventure, and we'd heard good things about the hikes around Asheville, North Carolina. My name's Caden, by the way. This trail wasn't too bad, more of a moderate than a hard hike. I'm not really in the best shape, so it got a little challenging near the end. A lot of elevation gain right before the lookout point. But honestly, the views, dude. You could see for miles across the mountains. Worth the sweat. Xanthus and I made a little campfire, cooked some hot dogs, and talked, you know, just regular guy stuff. We were going to spend the night out there, had a tent all set up and everything. That's when things started getting weird, though. We started hearing noises in the woods. Not like animal noises, though there were a lot of those. These were more like footsteps. Heavy ones. I told Xantus I was seeing something moving out of the corner of my eye, but he wasn't really buying it. We both have overactive imaginations. It was after dark by then. Hard to see anything clearly with the fire, even with a flashlight. We just kept hearing it out there, circling us, getting closer a little at a time. Honestly, I was getting freaked out. Screw this, Xanthus said finally, and I was pretty much in total agreement. We broke camp, threw everything in the car. It was almost midnight. It didn't feel safe waiting until the morning. I was driving, Xanthus dozing off in the passenger seat. I had no idea how long we'd been going when I saw it. Huge standing right in the middle of the road. At first I nearly swerved off the edge of the mountain. Looked almost human, but way too big, all hunched over. And man, its fur, silver gray in the moonlight. I slammed on the brakes. The thing turned and looked right at us, its body contorted in a weird, lurching way. Didn't feel like any animal I'd ever seen. Dude, wake up! I nudged Xanthus hard. What the hell is that? Xanthus bolted upright, and for a second we both just stared in horror. It started moving towards the car, and that's when I hit the gas. My heart was pounding. We didn't stop speeding until we hit a gas station outside of town. Xanthus didn't say a word at first. I just needed to know I wasn't crazy. You saw it too, right? He nodded, his face pale. Dude, I... I don't know what that was. We waited at that gas station until sunrise. We were both exhausted, but staying awake seemed like the safer option. At the first sign of light, we made the rest of the drive home. No sign of the thing. Now here's the thing, and I swear I'm not making this up. Last night, Xanthus went missing. We were hanging out at his place, and he stepped out to get something from his car. He never came back. His phone goes straight to voicemail. I went back to his place this morning, but he was gone. No sign of anything being wrong. Just... gone. The cops think he might have just taken off, but that doesn't make sense. Xanthus wouldn't do that without telling me. That thing out in the woods. The way it looked at us. I can't stop thinking that it's connected. 
could have been following us this whole time. Maybe it was waiting for Xanthus to be alone. I know that sounds crazy, but there's no way it was an animal, dude. I've been looking online, trying to find anything about similar sightings, or even folklore from around Asheville. There's some old tales about creatures in the woods, skinwalkers, stuff like that. But it doesn't match up with what we saw. That thing was huge, bipedal, covered in fur. I feel like I'm losing my mind not knowing what's real anymore. It felt too real to be just a story. I'm not sure what I'm going to do, man. I wanted to stay at Xanthus's place, in case he showed up, but honestly, I can't handle it alone. I keep thinking I see things out of the corner of my eye, hear noises behind me. The woods outside my own apartment don't feel safe anymore. I feel like it's watching me. I think I might head down to the police station again. At least there I won't feel so exposed. I can file a proper missing persons report. I don't know what else to do. Wait. I think I hear something in the hallway. It sounds like someone's trying to open the door. I didn't move when I heard the click of the lock. I held my breath. Maybe if it thought no one was here it would go away. No such luck. Footsteps, slower than I remembered, dragging a little, came down the hall. I could tell it was right outside the door. I had to do something. I grabbed my keys, at least that's something sharp. I edged towards the door, trying to stay quiet as possible. I had maybe two seconds between opening that door and facing whatever waited on the other side. My grip tightened on the keys. I couldn't stay here and wait for it to come to me. Had to try for a surprise attack. I counted down in my head. Three, two, one. I flung open the door and lunged, screaming and jabbing the keys towards the towering figure in the doorway. Nothing. The hallway was empty. I stared out in disbelief. Did it get spooked? Or did it want me to come out? Maybe... Maybe a distraction would work. I muttered to myself. I knew it was a stupid thought but I clung to any hope. The creature had left so suddenly. Surely there had to be a reason. A distraction might be enough to buy me some time. Frantically, I started grabbing stuff near the door. Keys, phone, wallet. If there was anything it would respond to, any reason it had retreated, I had to try something. I hurled these items into the hallway, wincing at the noise but holding out hope. Silence. Then that slow, heavy gait. It was coming back, louder this time, closer. I retreated into the apartment, heart pounding, had to try something else. My eyes fell on a dusty bottle of whiskey on the kitchen counter. I hadn't touched it in ages, but now, now it might be my only chance. I splashed a generous amount on the floor near me, soaking into the old carpet. It reeked of cheap alcohol, but I was hoping for a stronger smell. I pulled my lighter out of my pocket. All it took was the strike of a flint. The whiskey ignited, flames crawling across the carpet in a rush of heat. At first nothing, then a shriek that made the hair on my arms stand up. It sounded almost... hurt? Painful? The creature was backing away. Its giant shape retreated into the darkness of the hallway. The flames flickered low. Had it worked? Had I finally found something that would drive it off? Then I heard coughing, hacking, wheezing coughs and I realized with horror it wasn't the creature making that sound. The flames had crept into the hallway and smoke was beginning to fill the apartment. Xanthus. It must have gotten him in here, trapped him somehow. I couldn't let him die like that. I had to try again. Xanthus! I shouted through the smoke, the flames now stinging my eyes. If you can hear me, hold on! A weak groan was all I got back. I charged through the burning carpet, the heat searing my skin. I had a vague idea where his room was. I'd stumbled in blind once or twice in the middle of the night. The smoke grew thicker. I choked on it, dropping to my knees. The creature was long gone, but Xanthus was still in here, somewhere. I crawled, feeling my way blindly along the wall until my hand hit a door. I shoved it open, heat blasting me. Even with blurred vision, I recognized Xanthus's form hunched on the floor. I reached him, the fire now roaring behind me. No time to hesitate. I wrapped an arm around him, dragging him back towards the apartment entrance. 
The flames had died down to a flicker, but the smoke threatened to choke us. We were almost there. I just had to get us out before... My brain went fuzzy, my body heavy and weak. I felt the rough carpet scrape my leg as I collapsed. The last thing I saw was the blurry outline of fire trucks in the street outside moments before everything went black. I woke up in the hospital, my lungs burning, bandages tight across my arms and legs. Somehow, they found me and Xanthus in the smoldering remains of the apartment. We both survived, barely. There was severe smoke inhalation, some burns, but the doctors said we'd be okay physically, mentally. Well, that was another story. They found no signs of forced entry, but the fire damage messed up the evidence. No proof of the creature, no reason to believe that's how the fire started. The official report? Some stupid accident? Maybe we passed out drunk and didn't notice a candle left burning? Something like that. I knew better, but who would believe me? Xanthus doesn't remember a single thing from that night. He just woke up in the hospital. After days of questioning by the police, I couldn't tell him the truth. How could I? They'd lock me up in the psych ward faster than the thing in the woods could rip me apart. The nightmares are relentless. The feeling of being watched, that thing out there in the shadows. Even now as I write this, I can swear I hear the heavy sound of its footsteps outside my hospital window. I guess that part of it never really leaves you. They're releasing me soon. I don't know where I'll go, what I'll do. I just know it won't be back to my old life. After something like this, you can't. The creature, I don't know if it's gone for good or just biding its time. One day, maybe I'll find a group of weirdos who'll believe stories like mine. Hunt that thing down. For now, though, Survival is the only thing on my mind. Maybe I'll call that thing a Serto, a twisted reflection of human form, a shadow of the woods. All we can do is be ready for it when it returns. I live out in the country, maybe 40 miles from the nearest town. This little place I have in northwestern Washington is everything I need. There's a beat-up old ranch house, a few acres of brush, and a dense pine forest at the edge of the property. My only neighbors are deer, bunnies, and the occasional coyote. I'm the kind of guy who has always felt most at home in the woods. I went by Elbridge for many years. That's the name on my birth certificate and everything. But my buddies call me Bridger. I make my living doing landscape photos for real estate companies. It was through work that I ended up finding this place. This was six years ago, back when I still lived in Seattle. I was up here on a shoot and I got to talking with the property owner. He told me all about the area, how his great granddad had settled the land back in the 1800s. When I mentioned I was looking to get out of the city, well, he ended up making me a deal I couldn't refuse. Truth be told, I needed a little solitude after my breakup with Lucy. We'd been together for four years, and she'd become the whole center of my world. I guess that made it all the more gut-wrenching when she told me she didn't have those same feelings anymore. The city was full of memories I needed to escape. I needed a fresh start. These woods became my sanctuary. I'd spend whole days out there, scrambling up slopes, tracing the creek, getting inspiration for my work. And when the loneliness would hit, I'd think of that old saying, only the lonely can appreciate silence. One late August afternoon, when the heat was still heavy in the air, I was exploring deeper into the woods than I'd ever gone before. Something about a patch of sunlight filtering through the branches drew me further in. It was nearing sunset as I approached a big clearing. Just as I stepped out of the tree line, I heard a rustle somewhere off to my right. I froze. My head whipped around. And that's when I saw it. Maybe thirty feet away was the biggest damn wolf I'd ever laid eyes on. It was almost human-like in its stance, crouched low with its limbs spread apart. Its fur was a strange mottled brown with hints of gray, and I could see every muscle rippling beneath its skin. Its snout was long and wet, and the strangest part 
Well, I couldn't be fully sure I was seeing it right. It looked like it was grinning at me. The whole thing threw me off. Wolves aren't exactly uncommon here, but I'd never seen one behave like that. Usually they take one look at you and bolt. This thing, though, it seemed like it was sizing me up. A primal chill spread through me. I don't know if it was logic or sheer terror that took over, but the only thought in my head was a get out of there. I turned and sprinted. Branches whipped at my face. My heart felt like it had exploded right out of my chest. I could feel that thing's eyes on me, hot on my back. I knew I wasn't fooling myself. It was trailing me through the undergrowth. I was cursing myself for not packing my rifle that day. Without warning, I stumbled on a hidden root and went crashing to the ground. My ankle twisted under me with a sickening snap and I cried out in pain. I couldn't even think about getting up. That damn thing was going to have me cornered in seconds. I heard its low growl as it neared, the panting breath hot in the air. This is how I die, the thought flashed through my mind. I closed my eyes and braced myself. I don't know how long I laid there, just trembling, waiting for the final blow. But it never came. When I finally got the courage to peek through my eyelids, that creature was gone, just vanished like a damned ghost. I hauled myself up on a nearby tree trunk and assessed the damage. My ankle throbbed something fierce, but it didn't seem broken. With great difficulty, I managed to hobble my way back to the edge of the woods, cursing myself for being so reckless the entire way. I got myself fixed up by a doctor in town. It was a bad sprain, nothing too crazy. But the whole experience shook me to my core. Those moments out there in the forest felt like looking over the edge of an abyss. In the weeks that followed, I couldn't shake an unsettling feeling every time I looked at the tree line. When the wind whipped through the branches at night, it sounded like a low, predatory growl. My neighbor, an old-timer named Harlan, seemed to be the only one who didn't think I was crazy when I described the thing. He rubbed his beard as I told my tale, a thoughtful look in his eyes. That forest of yours, he started slowly. It's got a darker history than most folks know. Strange tales whispered round these parts, some going way back to the days of the first settlers. Sightings like yours ain't unheard of, though I haven't heard one myself in a long while. What exactly are you talking about, Harlan? I pressed. You think it was some kind of skinwalker or something? Harlan just shrugged. Some call him that. Others have other names. Point is, there's things in this world we don't quite understand. Things that defy what we think is natural. I scoffed at him. I mean, come on. I'm a man of reason. I'm no stranger to the tall tales people tell around campfires. But there was something in Harlan's demeanor. A seriousness that made me question things. Well, what am I supposed to do about it? I asked him. You think it'll come after me again? Harlan shook his head slowly. Hard to say, Bridger. Best thing you can do is be vigilant. Don't get caught alone in those woods again, and, well, maybe consider keeping a firearm on you from now on. I went home feeling a new weight settled on my shoulders. I tried to brush it all off as a freak event, an overactive imagination fueled by loneliness, but deep down, I didn't believe that. That creature's eyes, there was too much intelligence there too much awareness. It wasn't just an animal. Time seemed to speed up after that. The days and nights blended together. I started spending most of my time inside the house, only venturing out for necessities. The forest, my once beloved sanctuary, now seemed like a malevolent force lurking just out of sight. And the nightmares? Oh, the nightmares. I'd wake up drenched in sweat, the image of that grin seared into my mind. I'd imagine those razor-sharp claws tearing through my flesh, the hot splatter of blood against the crisp forest floor. One particularly windy night, about a month after my encounter, I was jolted awake by a blood-curdling howl. It pierced through the darkness like nothing I had ever heard before. I leaped out of bed and ran to the window. The yard was awash in moonlight, but I saw nothing. I stood there, frozen, 
my heart pounding a deafening rhythm in my chest. I knew that whatever it was, it had been close. The next morning, I was barely functioning, dragging myself through my daily motions. My buddy Cade came over that day to help me with some work on the property. We were fixing up the old horse stable near the back of the property when Cade froze, staring past me into the trees. Dude, what the hell is that? He asked in a hushed voice. I turned to see where he was looking. At first I saw nothing, and then it emerged from the shadows. The creature. It watched us with its piercing eyes, its massive form blending seamlessly with the tree trunks. It moved silently, padding closer with an unsettling grace. Its fur bristled, and I could see its teeth bared in a predatory snarl. Cade, get inside! I yelled, desperation making my voice hoarse. Cade didn't even hesitate. He took off towards the house like a bat out of hell, but as he ran, the creature lunged, a flash of fur and teeth. I heard a sickening thud, and a scream cut short. I ran towards Cade, frantic now. I found him slumped against a tree, his leg twisted at an impossible angle, a trail of blood smearing the ground beside him. The creature stood nearby, its eyes locked on me, its chest heaving, and for the first time I heard it growl a low, rumbling sound that seemed to rattle my very bones. Overwhelmed by fear and adrenaline, I bolted for the house. I could hear the creature pursuing me, its paws thudding against the ground, its breath hot on my heels. I burst through the back door and slammed it shut, fumbling with the lock. For the next few hellish hours, I fortified the house as best I could. I grabbed my rifle and barricaded the windows and doors. Outside, I could hear the creature pacing, sniffing at the gaps, snarling and scratching at the wood. With shaking hands, I called 911. My voice trembled as I frantically explained the situation to the operator. They kept asking me for a description of the creature, and all I could spit out was that it was something out of a nightmare, some unholy mix of wolf and man. Sir, are you injured? Are there any other victims? The operator's voice crackled through the line. Cade! I cried out, remembering my friend. I don't know. I don't know if he's... Sir, I need you to try and remain calm. She cut me off. Is there a safe place you can secure yourself? Secure myself? There was nowhere to hide in this place. I didn't know if whatever that thing was could rip through the door like it was nothing. But there was no way I was leaving Cade out there not while he might still be alive. Listen, I need you to send help right now. Someone's been hurt, and that thing is still out there, I pleaded, my voice cracking. Sir, units are on their way. For your safety, I need you to... I hung up. I couldn't listen to another second of her instructions. There was no time. With a burst of adrenaline, I grabbed a flashlight and another rifle from my gun cabinet. I loaded both with a shaking hand and threw open the door. The night air hung heavy and silent. My heart was pounding, the flashlight beam a shaky spot of light against the overwhelming darkness. I crept outside and called out for Cade. My voice echoed, mocking me, but there was no response. I moved towards the place where I'd last seen him, the flashlight beam cutting through the night like a weak sword against an invisible enemy. And there he was just lying there, a crumpled heap against the tree. I knelt beside him, my stomach twisting. He was alive, but barely. His mangled leg was soaked with blood, his face pale. Cade, I whispered, placing a hand on his shoulder. Hold on, buddy. Hold on, okay? His eyes fluttered open, and I thought I saw a spark of recognition in them. He attempted a weak smile, but then he coughed, a spatter of blood painting his lips. Bridger, you gotta... gotta get out of here, he rasped, his voice fading. Shut up, don't talk, I snapped, my voice ragged. Help's on the way, just hold on. I did my best to prop him up against the tree and stop the bleeding. The whole time I was scanning the tree line, that feeling of being watched, it never left for a second. And then I heard it, a low snarl coming from the edge of the darkness. The flashlight beam flicked over and there it was, silhouetted against the trees. It had gotten closer, 
boldness replacing caution in its stance. Oh God, no, I breathed, my voice hoarse with terror. Cade's eyes followed my gaze. When he saw it, he whimpered, his body shaking with a mix of fear and pain. I knew, right then, that there was no saving him. I couldn't get him out of here. Whatever twisted instinct drove this creature, it wasn't going to let us leave. There was only one thing left to do. Listen to me, Cade, I said, my voice tight. They're gonna take care of you, okay, buddy? They're gonna fix you up. Bridger, it's... He gasped, his eyes wide with terror. You need to close your eyes, buddy. Close them and rest. Help is on the way, I told him, forcing a calmness into my voice that I was far from feeling. I knew what I had to do. There was no time for goodbyes, no time for explanations or apologies. I stood up, took aim, and pulled the trigger. The gunshot echoed through the night, deafening in the silence. The bullet hit Cade squarely in the chest. His eyes went wide and empty, and his body slumped forward. The creature let out a furious roar. I aimed at its massive form, firing shot after shot in quick succession. It lunged forward, a blur of darkness. I hit it. I was sure of it. A spray of something warm and thick coated my face and I heard it snarl, but it kept coming. I had just enough time to see it leap into the air before I scrambled away, the force of its landing shattering the ground where I had stood seconds before. It stalked towards me, its movements growing erratic, like it was hurt. But the rage in its eyes hadn't diminished. If anything, it had intensified. I backed up, fumbling for more bullets with shaking hands. But this wasn't a clean kill. This was buying time. Time for what, I wasn't sure. I didn't even dare hope for rescue. Every fiber of my being wanted to close my eyes and wait for it all to be over. But there was a voice in the back of my mind. The voice of an old man who believed in things I couldn't explain. Maybe, just maybe, there was a chance. I ran back towards the house and then veered suddenly towards the stable. That creature was cunning, stronger than anything I had ever experienced. I needed more than brute force to survive, and there, in the darkness of the old, dusty stable, lay a flicker of hope. When Cade and I were working on renovations, I had found an old chest tucked into a hidden corner at the back. In it, there was a strange collection of objects, old hunting knives, some dried herbs I couldn't identify, and a heavy silver chain that had tarnished with age. Harlan had told me his grandfather used to believe in these sorts of rituals, whatever you want to call them. Some last defense against the things that walked the night. At the time, I thought it was all folklore nonsense, but what choice did I have? Hands trembling, I fumbled open the chest. The chain felt cool and heavy in my grasp. With clumsy fingers, I fashioned a crude loop around my neck. And just as that creature burst through the stable door, I closed my eyes and thought of everything Harlan had told me about these old ways. The thing screeched, a sound like fingernails on a chalkboard grating through the air. It lunged at me, and all I could do was stand my ground, my fingers clenched around that rough chain until my knuckles turned white. There was a blinding flash of light, and a wave of heat washed over me. I felt the force of something hitting me, knocking me to the ground. When I opened my eyes, I saw the creature lying motionless on the stable floor. Its fur was singed, its thick hide covered in blistered burns. There was a distant crackle of sirens. The cavalry was arriving, too late, and yet miraculously on time. In the days that followed, the authorities swarmed my property. That night was a blur of questions and shaky explanations. They found Cade's body bless his soul. They found the creature, too. The scientists who came up from wherever it is scientists come from, well, they were speechless. They didn't have a category in their neat little textbooks for whatever this thing was. Eventually, with nowhere to put it, they labeled it a canine cryptid on their reports. I don't even understand what half of that means. After a whole lot of interviews and psychological evaluations, they released me a broken man in the eyes of the county sheriff. I still have trouble sleeping at night, 
still hear that snarl in every rustle of leaves. They couldn't explain where it came from, what it wanted, or why it chose to terrorize me. The official story boiled down to rabid wolf attack. Survivor defended himself in a remarkable act of courage. Harlan didn't seem surprised by any of it. When I next saw him, he nodded solemnly and said, Some things, they walk the shadows alongside us, Bridger. They ain't of our world, and most folks never see him. Consider yourself lucky, or cursed, depending on how you see it. And maybe he's right. Maybe I am cursed. But all those labels, scientists and officials like to slap on things, they don't change a damn thing. What happened out there? It was real. It changed me. I sold the property out in the woods, packed up what little I had left, and moved back to the city. I haven't picked up a camera since. Maybe someday, that spark will come back. Maybe someday, I'll learn to live with the shadows that cling to me, and sometimes on the quiet nights, when the city is asleep and I can't find peace, I wonder... Whatever that thing was, I gave it a name now. I call it the Norca. Maybe remembering is the only way to keep it at bay, or maybe someday it'll return to finish what it started. I lived out in the countryside of Oklahoma for a little while. Needed to get away from the big city for a change, you know? Had a cute little cabin all to myself, a few friendly neighbors scattered miles apart, and a whole lot of trees and quiet. Peaceful. Almost too peaceful. I'm a night owl, so a lot of times I'd be just kicking back with a beer after midnight. Maybe catch the late reruns. Maybe just sit and listen to the world breathe. That first night, it was the sound that woke me up. Not loud, really, just out of place like a creaky gate, only more of a dragging, scraping sound. I'm not gonna lie, I'm used to weird noises in the woods, but this made me sit up and pay attention. Maybe a critter messing with my trash. Whatever it was, it was close. I stepped over to the window, expecting to see a possum or a raccoon having a midnight snack, but there was nothing there. Just the still air under an old Oklahoma moon. That was the first time. Over the next few weeks, I kept getting awoken by the same scraping noise, always close by, always just outside my sight. I got myself a motion-activated floodlight, the kind so bright you could practically read by it. That did the trick. Sorta. Next time, BAM! The light kicked on, and there it was. Not a critter, though. Not any animal I'd ever seen before. First thing you gotta know, this thing was huge. Like standing on two legs, it had to be over seven feet tall, probably closer to eight. Shaggy, dark fur covered it all over, thicker along its neck and shoulders. And that face? I'd never seen eyes like that on any animal. Not an evil red or anything cartoonish like that. Just big and pale and somehow full of, I don't know, like it could see more than just what was in front of it. Now the floodlight probably surprised it as much as it did me because that giant thing whipped around, hunched over a little, and bolted into the trees, vanished into the darkness like it was never there. After that, I started keeping a bigger weapon than a baseball bat by my bed. I'm not a hunter, just seemed like the smart play. Anyway, the creature kept coming. Not every night, but often enough to keep me on edge. It'd peek around corners, pace at the edge of the woods, sometimes just stand there, staring at the cabin. Even if the lights didn't catch it, I'd still hear that scraping sound it made, and my blood would run cold. Now I'm not the jumpy type, but this thing, it was more than unnerving. It was like it was studying me, learning my routine. There was an intelligence in its eyes, something cold and calculating. That's when I started talking to my neighbors, told them about the weird wolf thing. They got real serious, told me stories the kind passed down for generations in those parts. Whispers about two-legged creatures stalking the Oklahoma woods, sightings going back centuries. They didn't use the word werewolf, but I knew what they meant. One of those neighbors, 
old Garth had an idea. Only thing keeps those critters off, he said, his voice low, is fire. Build yourself a good blaze, keep it going all through the night. That'll deter it. Made sense to me. Desperate times and all that. So, that weekend, I cleared a big space out back and built myself a fire pit. Come nightfall, I got a bonfire roaring, big enough to warm the whole county and then some. Things were quiet at first, eerily so. I almost thought Garth's idea had done the trick, sent the creature packing. Right around two in the morning, though, there it was, watching from the tree line. I could feel its gaze even with the fire between us. The flames seemed to make those pale eyes glow, and I swear it looked amused. The next few hours were torture. The wolf thing never came any closer, never rushed the flames like Garth had said it would fear. Instead, it just... paced. Back and forth, that dragging scrape of claws on dirt echoing all through the night. I was shivering, and not just from the cold. As dawn finally broke, it slunk back into the trees with that same unnerving grace. I stumbled back inside and collapsed, didn't sleep a wink. The day after, I went into town, found myself a for sale sign, and got packing. I called Garth, told him the fire hadn't worked, and his voice had gone real somber. They're smart, he said. Sometimes fire ain't enough. I was out of there before the week was up, sold the cabin cheap, Told folks I needed a change of scenery. Didn't pack my gun, though. Figure whoever buys that place might need it more than I ever did. See, the thing about those Oklahoma woods, they're vast and old, and they hide all kinds of things. I learned that the hard way. Sometimes maybe it's best to just keep to the city, you know? Less chance of bumping into something that can outsmart a bonfire and make your blood run ice cold with just a look. A few weeks back, I went to visit my cousin, Tiffany, up in Wyoming. She and her husband, Rydell, bought a big chunk of land on the outskirts of Pinedale, and she's been trying to convince me to move up from Texas. I'm not sure about all that, but damn if she wasn't right about those wide-open spaces doing something good for a man's soul. Her land borders a national forest, and she's always going on about the wildlife and the quiet. Me, I'm used to noise, crowds, always having something to do. But after a few days of hiking, breathing in that crisp air and sleeping like a baby, I started to get it a little. Still wouldn't move there, though. Too far from a burger joint. Anyway, it all went weird on night three. I woke up thirsty, so I snuck downstairs for a glass of water. Tiffany keeps those windows uncovered even at night. Guess it feels safe out there. She had this huge picture window facing the trees, and I swear, just outside in the moonlight, I saw a figure standing stock still. Now here's the thing, folks. It was tall, like NBA player tall but hunched over, and furry, like covered in dark fur from head to toe. I blinked, thinking it was just shadows playing tricks on me. But when it turned its head, that's when I knew something was seriously off. Massive snout way too long for a bear, and its eyes... Well, I couldn't see a color, but they were shining in the dark. It tilted its head at me, let out this low, rumbling growl, and then just... strode off into the trees. Jason? What are you doing up? Tiffany startled me, rubbing the sleep out of her eyes. Uh, just water, I stammered, still trying to figure out what the hell I'd just seen. Everything okay? She asked. Yeah, yeah, fine. Just thought I, uh, saw something out there. I shrugged, already regretting saying anything. She gave me this look. You know the one. Like your older sibling knows you're hiding something. Well, if you're seeing things, it's probably time for bed. She said with a grin, heading back upstairs. Next morning, I couldn't get that thing out of my head. Over breakfast... I finally fessed up to Tiffany and Rydell, expected them to laugh, maybe call me crazy, but they didn't. Sounds like you've met one of the locals, Rydell said, his face grim. Locals? You mean like actual Bigfoot? I scoffed. Tiffany nudged him. 
Not Bigfoot, she said, her voice low. The old-timers around here have stories about creatures that walk like men but aren't. I started to feel that city boy skepticism again, but then Rydell chimed in. Look, I ain't one for campfire tales, but there's things that happen here you can't explain by just bears and coyotes. I've heard howls that freeze your blood, seen tracks no animal I know could make. I was hooked. These weren't the kind of folks to make stuff up. Rydell wasn't the type to scare easy, and Tiffany, well, she was always the practical one. So if they were taking this seriously... You think that thing is going to come back? I asked. Can't say for sure, Rydell said. But if you want my advice, Jason, don't go out alone at night, and maybe keep a light on when you sleep. That afternoon, Rydell took me out to his shed. Guess who has a whole damn hunting arsenal stashed out there? He hands me a shotgun, shells, the works. Just in case, he said, this thing's probably more scared of you than you are of it, but never hurts to be prepared. The rest of that day, I felt like I was in one of those old westerns, waiting for the bad guys to come riding into town. I kept checking the tree line, jumping at every sound. Night fell, and I decided to take Rydell's advice and leave the porch light on. Figured even if the creature came back, the light might spook it away. Plus, shotgun by the bed, you know, for peace of mind. Sleep was a no-go. I lay there, every creak and rustle of leaves setting my heart racing. And then there it was, the growl. Low and guttural, way too close for comfort but this time it wasn't alone. More voices joined in, a whole chorus of those deep howls. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end. I heard Tiffany shout something from her room, Rydell yelling right after. My hands were shaking as I loaded the shotgun. I crept to the window, peeking through the blinds. Out in the clearing, I saw them, at least three of those creatures. They were circling the house, their fur bristling in the moonlight. One of them let out a howl that sounded like pure rage, and all of them started pacing, drawing closer. I could make out their claws, long and sharp, clicking against the stones. My mind raced. Were these things going to try and break in? Suddenly, I heard a crash from downstairs. Tiffany was screaming. Rydell was bellowing something I couldn't make out. Without thinking, I bolted down the stairs, shotgun raised. The scene at the bottom of those stairs will haunt me forever. One of the creatures, it had gotten inside. I could see its massive, hulking shape in the shadows, fur matted with blood. Rydell was on the floor, his arm twisted at an impossible angle, gashes across his chest. Tiffany was backed against a wall, sobbing, one hand pressed to her bleeding shoulder. That primal rage from outside boiled up in me. I remember screaming, the sound raw and wild, and then the blast of the shotgun. The creature roared, a deafening, wounded sound. I saw a flash of movement as it lunged towards Tiffany. Without thinking, I pulled the trigger again, and again. The creature staggered backwards, its howls now choked gurgles. It collapsed in a heap, blood pooling around it. For a moment, the only sound was Tiffany's harsh sobbing. Then, those other howls outside stopped dead, like someone had hit the mute button on a nightmare. In the aftermath, it was chaos. The police arrived, their flashlights cutting through the darkness. Then the paramedics, the questions, the statements. There were even some guys in suits from Fish and Wildlife, shaking their heads and taking measurements of the body. They'd never seen anything like it, they said. The newspapers ran with it, of course. Mystery creature killed in Wyoming, they screamed. Some local hunters claimed they'd always known things like that lurked in the shadows. The old-timers nodded sagely and said they weren't surprised none. Me. I wish I could say it didn't get to me. Tiffany and Rydell patched themselves up, and they never spoke much of that night again. Like some unspoken agreement to forget. They sold that land a few months later. I headed back to Texas, back to the city lights and the comforting din of traffic. But sometimes, 
in the dead of night, I hear a sound like a howl carried on the wind. Or I catch a glimpse of something tall and dark move out of the corner of my eye. And then, I remember those shining eyes, that muzzle slick with blood, and the name that Tiffany had whispered the next day as she stared at the creature's body. A Lucatir. Sometimes, when I think of its claws, of its rage, I swear, if I listen hard enough, I can still hear that dying, gurgling roar. The thing is, I'd do it all again in a heartbeat if it meant protecting people I love. I guess what happened out there in Wyoming didn't just change the landscape. It changed something in me, too. Some corners of the world are wilder than we think, and maybe they're better off left alone. Back in 2009, I was working as a ranch hand up in the Montana wilderness. My name is Riker, and let me tell you, those were some wild, lonely times. Nearest town was a good hour's drive away, and the only other folks out there were my boss, old man Silas, and his daughter Ember. Sweet girl, a bit younger than me, with eyes the color of those wild flowers that grow along the creek. Anyhow, late that fall, Silas sent me into the high country to round up the stray cattle before winter hit. Said it'd be a couple days' work tops, but sometimes those mountains have their own plans. First night out, a blizzard kicked up so fierce I damn near froze in my saddle. Managed to find shelter in this old trapper's cabin, small and run down, but better than nothing. Next morning, the snow let up enough to travel. Figured I'd push on, find those cattle and get back to the ranch. That's when things got... strange. Now I've seen my share of weird stuff out in the wilderness. Animals acting skittish, unexplained noises, that kind of thing. But this was different. Every now and then, I'd catch a glimpse of something moving at the edge of the trees. A flicker of shadow that was a little too big, a little too fast to be a deer or a bear. And the footprints I found? Man, I wish I hadn't seen those. They weren't right. Big, with long claws, but shaped like a person's foot. I tried to laugh it off, figured it was the isolation playing tricks on my mind. Maybe some freakishly large mountain lion, though those are pretty rare up that high. But deep down, this nagging feeling just wouldn't go away. Like those woods had eyes, and they were fixed on me. Second day, I finally find the stray herd huddled up in a canyon. Should have been a relief, right? Well... That relief was short-lived. While I was getting the cattle moving, I hear this howl pierce through the trees. Sounded human, but not quite. Something just off about it, like the thing that made it had never learned how to scream right. Panic hits me like a fist to the gut. I spur my horse, trying to get the herd down the canyon, and that's when I see it. Bursting out of the trees, this... creature. It was the size of a man hunched over, but covered in thick, dark fur. Powerful legs built for running, and its arms were long, tipped with wicked claws. And its head, it was like a wolf's, only twisted, wrong. The jaw too long, the teeth too many. For a moment, we just stared at each other. My heart was pounding, the cattle were bellowing in fear, and this thing, it watched us with a hungry intelligence that made my skin crawl. Then, it lunged. Now I'm no stranger to danger. I've broken wild horses, stared down charging bulls. But this was different. This was primal. The fear of something that wasn't meant to be in the same world as humans. I fumbled for my rifle, but the beast was too fast. It tackled one of the cows, ripping at its throat with those awful claws. The smell of blood was thick in the air, and the herd stampeded, scattering in every direction. Blind luck, that's the only reason I survived that day. As the creature tore into its meal, I managed to scramble back onto my horse and take off down the canyon. I didn't stop riding until I reached the ranch, pushing my horse to the brink of exhaustion. Silas and Ember didn't quite believe my wild tale, figured I got caught in the storm and my imagination ran wild. Maybe they were right. I never did go back up to those high pastures to look for the rest of the cattle. 
Some things, it's just better to leave undisturbed. But even after all these years, sometimes at night, when the wind howls around the ranch house, I swear I can still hear the echo of that blood-curdling cry.